Subscribe to the Mystic Vibrations Shock of the Hour program today and never miss another episode. The Shock of the Hour is a radio and exclusive program produced every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. By now, I am sure that you are aware that all our programs are packed with information, inspiration, mystic vibrations, as well as hot button topics. Every evening, we enter into a different dimension, even if it is a part two of the previous program. Whether it's history or mystery, biology or philosophy, domestic affairs or the locks of your hair, the mystic vibration is sure to bring something new and interesting to the table every evening. So never miss another episode again. Subscribe to the Shock of the Hour now. And don't forget your key Swahili word of the day and your daily scientific fact. So, to subscribe, give us an email, priestisaac27 at gmail.com or call or WhatsApp us today. Area code 1268-728-3162. The shock of the hour. Never miss another program. And a special note to all our new subscribers. All our new subscribers will receive a special copy of the DVD documentary. Full length. The Night of the Black Tiger, The Divinity of Marcus Masaga.
Yes, maybe it's the same as the internet radio station, YouTube, Facebook, I like to look at the Iowa business. You can pay the tax for the Iowa gathering in this whole of times. I like acknowledging the nine I miss all the ones from overland and seas that have seen it fit to gather more Sinai in these. I precious times, as one's know, just to set the timetable and the, at the gathering. And I was looking to be reasoning on the cannabis and Rastafari within today, where I and I have three major presenters, which is Ras Aisagaiku, uh, Big Yayavi, Ras Ayavi, and Ras Yalan. We'll be talking on different aspects as one's know what was classified here in Wadadi with the herb. Even as I and I going forward, acknowledging also in I and I presence, Brother Haile, who was one of the elders of the Rastafari community of Antigua Wadadi, and being the Rastida, Chris Isaac, one who is very much into the process of stimulating the thoughts amongst I and I Rastafari within what I believe and even on a further basis. So before I get into the, the, the meat of the reasoning, I and I would just ask them two ones to give I and I a short uh, aspect of welcome to our overseas guests and say something as to the gathering and the process that I and I have overtaken to complete within these three days and even more going forward. So, well, look, Heidi, there I could. Of course, 
the atmosphere of prohibition then, which was so suppressing and oppressing to Rastafari and others, the prohibition of cannabis. We reached out to VC Brothers Prime Minister and suggested to him that he should use his good offices as Prime Minister to decriminalize and legalize cannabis. His answer was very interesting. Now this is in the 1980s. Consider where the world was then in terms of white supremacy, the rampancy of white supremacy, still rampant today of course, and the rigidity and the rigor with which <clears throat> the prohibition of, of ganja was being prosecuted. In that context, the answer, V.C. Bird's answer to us was that he could not do that. And the reason he could not do that was that Antigua, a small nation, could not legalize ganja or decriminalize ganja while countries like Britain, and America and Canada had such dreadful laws going against the herb. Laws which of course, which of course were duplicated and replicated here in Antigua and Barbuda. V.C. Bird's answer was that he would have to wait until countries like England and America decriminalize and or legalize ganja before he could even think of doing something like that. Now bear in mind that this was the head, the elected head of a sovereign independent nation, speaking like that. And I say that to make the point that historically and up until now, this lack of confidence, this lack of self-esteem that black leaders are characterized by in this world is very striking. Sovereignty, by international law, sovereignty is equal and indivisible. You do not have big sovereignty and little sovereignty. Independence legally by international law is an equal status for all independent nations. You are not more important because you are a big independent nation and I am a small independent nation. When we gather together around the table of international discourse, theoretically and legally, all of us are equal. We enjoy sovereignty, we enjoy independence, on paper, but in actual fact, our leaders were not willing to demonstrate to the world that they had the power, as independent sovereigns, they had the power to control affairs, totally control the affairs of their nation, internally in particular, without the interference of other nations. And this, of course, is the bedrock of international law, non-interference in the affairs of independent states. What could we do when the Prime Minister was telling us, well, I understand your position, but I cannot do that until the white supremacists have decided to do it for themselves. <laughs> Decades passed, we were persecuted, we were murdered, we were put in jail, lives were destroyed, and families were destroyed because of that prohibition. Something that our leadership, our independent sovereign leadership, was unwilling to do anything about because they felt themselves inferior to the bigger nations. They felt that they were afraid to ruffle the feathers of the big boys in London, in Washington, as the case might be. Decades later, here we are today. Various states in America have legalized cannabis. Canada is the second uh, country in the world, apart from Uruguay, after Uruguay, to have completely legalized it for recreational, medical uses, whatever. 
Now that that has happened, just as V.C. Byrd has had intimated, the timid, quizzling leaderships of countries like Antigua and Jamaica and other black nations have run up to the table to say, I will legalize it too, because you, the big white supremacists, have now done so. This is totally unacceptable. This is completely unacceptable. And I say that to make the point that it is because of this unwillingness of black leaders to accept the power, the political power, that the populations have put in their hands and to understand that power in the international context and in the context of international law and global affairs, their unwillingness to comprehend their situation in the world that has the black nation globally in the position that we are in today. As mendicants begging all around for money to subsidize our national budgets, as leaders who are unable to grapple and come to grips with the very dreadful problems that persist in so many of our countries today. And I say that because I'm looking at the black world globally. We look at our beloved continent, our ancestral continent. The wars do not cease. The stupid civil wars do not cease. In fact, they seem to multiply. Look at Cameroon today. At peace and one of the most peaceful and developing, well-developing nations in Africa up to maybe three, four years ago. Today it is engulfed with a terrible fratricidal war between those who speak English and those who speak French. A simple matter like that. I talk English, you talk French. We are in a bilingual nation called Cameroon. And Outside forces, as is always the case with these stupid wars in Africa, outside forces look for every little division they can find in the society to impose themselves and create division and strife, violence, mayhem and suffering on the ordinary people of the country. Sudan, so promising, when they gained their independence, that is South Sudan a few years ago, could possibly one of the, be one of the richest countries in Africa because of its abundance of oil and agricultural resources. Engulfed in civil war. Women and children, girls being raped daily. Murders at the order of the day. Somalia, an ungovernable place. And the list goes on and on with respect to the African countries. Congo. What bigger sore on the face of Africa than the Republic of Congo? Potentially, perhaps, one of the richest countries in the world. Where is Congo today? Just out of the most horrible civil war where over three million people were killed, and many having died by starvation. And it goes on and on. Libya, absolutely destroyed. A country which had the highest living standard of living in Africa. Potentially one of the wealthiest countries per capita in the world. A country which had no debt, which had vast reserves of gold. Where is Libya today? Its leader assassinated by the orders of President Sarkozy of France and that woman who was um, Clinton, who was, what was she at the time? Secretary of State. Sarkozy and her got together and decided this African leader must be killed because what he's doing is going to take Africa too far down the road. True sovereignty and independence. Today, Libya is destroyed. And as I say, it goes on and on. Mauritania, you can count them all. This is the state of affairs we are in where we are afraid to assert ourselves according to the rights that we are given by international law, which rights other nations enjoy and use to their own advantage. So when V.C. Bird could have told us, I 
cannot do that because I have to wait for America and Britain and Canada. We felt ashamed. Ashamed to the extent that here we were newly independent and our Prime Minister was telling us he is unwilling to assert his independence and his sovereignty in the defense of the rights of his own people. <laughs> Decades later, as I say, we are here and we are enjoying the opening of the door, as it were, so that we have a situation now where, by law, the prohibition is over, the violence against us is over, theoretically at least, and we are looking to compete, in fact, as a nation in what is becoming a global industry surrounding the cultivation and use of the cannabis plant. It could be that we are too late to get any great advantage out of this new global economic phenomenon, because it is an economic phenomenon now. Too late in the sense that just within a two, three years, look how far the US and Canada have gone in terms of taking advantage an economic advantage in particular, not to mention the advantages offered in terms of health, health care, medical interventions of the cannabis oil and so forth, all of which properties were known a long time ago. We are here now perhaps trying to catch up. I don't know how difficult or how easy that might be because a few days ago, Looking at international news, I saw a photo of a warehouse in Canada that is owned by one of the cannabis producers. And they had pictures of the inside of this warehouse where they had a storage of cannabis, of cured cannabis. And they were saying in that news item that the amount of cannabis in that warehouse, just in that single warehouse, was 500 billion US dollars, 500 million, sorry, US dollars worth of cannabis. 500 million US dollars worth of cured cannabis in a warehouse in Canada. I don't know how long it would take us to produce 500 million dollars worth of cannabis in Antigua and Barbuda. But I say that to demonstrate that if we think that we are going to catch up as a nation, we are going to use this agricultural resource to get into export markets and to make vast amounts of money, etc., for the government, for the people, etc., to develop the country, it may be that we are mistaken. It may be that we are too late. It may be that what I consider to be the single most overriding motive for the decriminalization and legalization of Ganja in Antigua and Barbuda, which is an economic motive on the part of the government, not a motive having anything to do with hatred of oppression against Rasta and others, not a motive having to do with wanting to create a level playing field, a peaceful atmosphere for Rasta, to thrive, it simply has to do, on the examination, you will find out it has to do with the fact that certain governments just do not know, just don't understand how to develop their nations economically. They are highly indebted. Their various economic policies and fiscal policies have failed, so their countries are on the brink virtually of economic collapse. And it is in this atmosphere that certain governments are looking to cannabis as a resource that can save them from economic collapse and save their government from the consequences of economic collapse, which of course is the fall of the government itself.
So we, we should not delude ourselves in our analysis of the situation and in our understanding of what we are up against. Because if we are not careful, if we are not, well, forthright in our presentations, it may well be that whatever the benefits that could come from this new movement will not be shared to any great extent by ourselves. I say these words from a cautionary perspective, not to diminish any euphoria or any uh, any happiness we might have about this change in the change in, in circumstances because certainly all oppression must cease and the Rastafari movement from the beginning was and is a movement against oppression principally of black people but of people everywhere Rasta is a movement against oppression and for daring to rise our heads and condemn oppression and agitate against oppression locally and globally, we have suffered more than any other social group in the Caribbean. We have been excluded, we have been marginalized, we have been pauperized, we have been killed. And now today that the white supremacists have decided that they will no longer tolerate their children being victimized by police forces for a herd that is perhaps more beneficial than most herds. For a herd that has clear advantages in many aspects of application, including medicine and healthcare. It is because the tables were turning and that over the past several years, it is white youths who were advocating for legalization, for the right to use herb, etc. The white power structure decided the time had come. In addition to the fact that the greedy capitalists saw so much money in front of them out of this industry, it was as a result of that that Canada, the United States, and other Western white nations have moved to this position where we are today. So, once more, we are here in the back seat, as it were, and we need to maneuver ourselves and stand for the rights that are given to us by natural law, by our Creator. We need to maneuver ourselves into a position where if there are indeed economic benefits to be made from the legalization of cannabis, then certainly such benefits must be open to all equally. I am quite unhappy with the legislation as it is because my view is that a plant is a plant, is a plant, is a plant, and just that you cannot, just that you cannot legalize to tell me I can only have six or four sugarcane plants in my, in my yard, or I can't have more than four mango trees in my yard. I reject the notion that you can come and properly and correctly legalize for me that I cannot have more than four cannabis plants in my yard. I take the view that cannabis should be a cash crop, like any other potential cash crop, like sugar cane, like cotton, like aloe vera. It should be a cash crop that any agriculturist may choose to grow. And the proceeds of his harvest should be sold perhaps to a marketing board, a national marketing board, which in alliance with the Ministry of Agriculture 
would have their various extension and field officers who can liaise and engage with the farmers to ensure the correct quality and the correct strength and so forth of the cannabis that they wish to buy. So with those few words, I put my position on the table. I think we are still being disadvantaged. I think we have been oppressed and advantaged for too long with this matter. And I think the battle is still on for us to have a regime surrounding the cannabis plant, planting and usage for us to have a regime that is really quite and totally acceptable to us all. Thank you. Give a chance to rely for Alafia to each and every one. Salamta and blessed love. Honorable Priest Isaac here. It is with great joy that I am happy to announce to you that I have officially released my first ebook, Anu Ancient and Modern Revisited. This is the continuation process of our easy to read books. Within the pages of Anu Ancient and Modern Revisited, we take the time to show you the spiritual connection with the island of Antigua and Heliopolis in Kemet in Egypt, with the island of Antigua and the legendary continent of Atlantis. We also highlight Green Castle Hill, also known as Mount Anu, which is known as the Stonehenge of the Caribbean, with the countless of megaliths that align with the movements of the heavens. This is a must-read for all those who are students of the esoteric realms, astronomy, geology, and ancient sites. Of course, to get a copy of your book, all you have to do is to contact us at area code 1268-7283162, call, text, or even WhatsApp. Or you can email us at priestisaac 27 at gmail.com to get a copy of your ebook and ancient and modern. It is an easy to read book, it may appear light, but it is extremely heavy. Subscribe to the Mystic Vibrations Shock of the Hour program today and never miss another episode. The Shock of the Hour is a Radio Anu exclusive program produced every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. By now I am sure that you are aware that all our programs are packed with information, inspiration, mystic vibrations as well as hot button topics. Every evening we enter into a different dimension, even if it is a part two of the previous program. Whether it's history or mystery, biology or philosophy, domestic affairs or the locks of your hair, the mystic vibration is sure to bring something new and interesting to the table every evening. So never miss another episode again. Subscribe to the Shock of the Hour now. And don't forget your key Swahili word of the day and your daily scientific fact. So, to subscribe, give us an email, priestisaac27 at gmail.com or call or WhatsApp us today. Area code 1268-728-3162. The Shock of the Hour. Never miss another program. And a special note to all our new subscribers. All our new subscribers will receive a special copy of the DVD documentary, Full Length, The Night of the Black Tiger, The Divinity of Marcus Messiah Black.